Tim coming to you from Bend and Romita United Methodist Churches uh, here in Central Texas, uh, keeping the word alive and, and uh, active in, uh, in rural places in the far reaches of the world, uh, trying to be faithful United Methodist. Now, we've been talking about different Bible themes and uh, podcasts, so we've been, this is the general conference week, uh, two weeks actually. And so the Methodists from all over the world are coming to the United States to, to set out the rules for the next four years of uh, what it takes to be a Methodist and uh, where we stand, uh, especially with the disaffiliation of some of the other some of the churches who have left the denomination. Uh, what do we do with the, the folks who are left? Where do we stand? And what uh, what new areas can we enter into the next, in the coming years? So we're, they're discussing that right now and doing all the, the committee work of the institution that has to be done. Uh, but that uh, spurred me to uh, talk a little bit about our denomination, about where the Methodist Church came from. Uh, we talked about uh, the history of the, of the time in England, what uh, prepared for that, uh, for that time. We talked about John Wesley, who uh, was a uh, founder of the Methodist Church and some of the ideas that, that are uh, put into the church that uh, made the Methodist Church what it is today. Uh, but uh, one of the things that really shaped the Methodist Church is uh, coming to America. This was 17th century England, just at the time when uh, people were uh, leaving there. There was a, it was a, they looked for economic opportunity because the uh, social system was very rigid. Uh, in the classes, and uh, you were you were expected to stay in your class and be uh, whatever your father or mother was, uh, so that you uh, had to uh, you didn't have opportunity to be anything different. It also was a time of religious oppression uh, because of a variety of, uh, uh, of struggles in, in the institutional church uh, that was also a part of the of the government. Uh, and they would uh, outlaw some of their folks. Uh, and to this day, uh, everyone who's not Church of England is called a nonconformist. Uh, not, actually, I kind of like that, that uh, title for, for the United Method. Uh, but uh, people started coming to the, to the English colony. Uh, and so they, many of the Methodists who were part of the the class meetings and part of the preaching uh, points uh, came to this country, uh, to, to the colonies in America, and uh, wanted to have the same thing. So they began writing back to John Wesley, please uh, send pastors here. We need pastors so that we can establish churches. Uh, so John Wesley tried to oblige. He went uh, to the bishops in the, of the Church of England and said, will you ordain some pastors for me to uh, to send to America, and basically they said, no, we won't. And so John Wesley just said, well, I think I'll do it myself. So he began ordaining pastors and sending them to the colonies. Uh, they uh, came to America, and there was not any financial back, backing. The population was fairly thin, so they had to figure out a way uh, to uh, be preaching uh, in this country. Uh, the established churches were only in the, the, uh, in the cities, uh, and so most of the population lived in the country. And so they began to figure out how to do that, and one of the things they did was to have circuit riders. They would have a pastor who, uh, for what they did not have to go back to the Church of England, did not travel across the ocean and back again uh, to be ordained, uh, but they had the local pastor's uh, education uh, to teach them how to be a pastor and the, the basics of the Methodist Church and of the Bible and uh, of preaching. And so they would send them out uh, and they would go from place to place. They would spend uh, several days at one point and then uh, pick up and go to the next place. Uh, they would preach at a different church each Sunday. So they had what they called uh, 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 three-point charges, uh, four-point charges, and five-point charges. That meant that uh, they would go to one place and, and do the baptism, do the funerals, do the, the confirmation, uh, preach, uh, and 
and do all those things in one place and then uh, in the middle of the week they would pack up and, and ride their horse on to the next one uh, to the next place and stay there long enough and uh, so uh, one of the things that, that was required uh, was if you were a circuit rider you had to be single and so you uh, didn't get out and leave your family uh, to fend for themselves and so all the early circuit riders were, uh, were men and they were single and it was a rough life uh, I read somewhere the average age uh, span of a circuit rider was 35 so there were Indians uh, to, to contend with wild animals uh, snake bites uh, illnesses in the middle of nowhere uh, lack of food uh, so it was a kind of a tough life but we overcame the lack of resources by traveling from place to place and they would take up an offering uh, and give it to the pastor so that they could uh, uh, have enough money to go on to the next place. Uh, that, uh, that made us able to uh, move western, went towards the west, uh, when uh, other churches, uh, Presbyterian, Lutheran uh, churches, had to have a state church where the, the pastor lived and, and uh, for, stayed there for a long time. Uh, the Methodist church were flexible enough to send out into new places. Uh, one place uh, in Tennessee sent uh, a pastor at one point, a, a circuit rider, and, uh, to Texas. And uh, he, he was given the circuit of Texas. So you can imagine riding a horseback over the entire state of Texas uh, back before it was a state, when it was still part of Mexico. Uh, so that was a, a, a pastor of church that was uh, established in uh, in 1841. And one of those early circuit riders that uh, that came to Texas uh, came to that church in in Fort Lavaca, in the Gonzales and and uh, in Travis Park uh, to establish churches, and then move on. Uh, they didn't uh, have a regular set pastors, so that's one of the reasons why uh, they would get ready for the circuit rider uh, to come and do all the things that I needed to do uh, they would uh, wait for them to, to do communion uh, for one thing uh, and they uh, when the circuit rider wasn't there they had the class meetings uh, so that you would uh, activate your faith and work on uh, your sense of community um, and the Methodist Church was also part of the camp meetings uh, camp meetings started um, I think around 1800, uh, and uh, became a great boon to the to the faith. Uh, people preaching revival uh, in camp meetings that would last for two weeks or longer, and everybody would uh, pack up what they had and go to the camp and set up camp and and uh, meet their neighbors and and have preaching and and singing, and uh, sometimes four preachers were preaching all at the same time in different parts of the camp. And so it was an exciting time. It was uh, something that when you lived in the wilderness, you didn't get to do. Uh, so for one thing, the, the boys and girls got to meet other people so they could uh, find someone to marry. Uh, so there was a lot of activity going on. But there's, uh, that's part of what the Methodist Church uh, did. Uh, John Wesley sent over an order of service, but then we went west and they didn't have copy machines and they didn't have... Um, uh, bulletins and things like that to, to follow. Uh, so they they kind of made up a, a very informal style of worship. Uh, lately, they've been kind of we've been sort of uh, reviving that uh, that tradition of, uh, of liturgy, of, of having set prayers and things like that. Uh, of course, in the contemporary worship came in and changed all that too. Uh, but uh, that's one of the things that the West shaped uh, the Methodist as we moved out into the into the wilderness. So the Methodist Church, uh, it started uh, right after the Revolutionary War because we were associated with the English and that was not a time to be very popular to be associated with England. And so uh, at the Christmas conference, um, I think it was uh, in the uh, uh, 17... Uh, 1785, I believe, or um, in, in that time, there was a, a conference that established the Methodist Church. Um, John Wesley also sent superintendents to be uh, over the pastors, and uh, on the boat on the way over, 
uh, they decided they'd like to be bishops. So that's why we have bishops, because uh, uh, Bishop Coke and Bishop Asbury decided to call themselves that and ordain each other uh, so that they could supervise the, uh, the fledging Methodist church. Uh, so we have an Episcopal form of government that uh, means that uh, the pastors get sent around by the bishop uh, from place to place. Uh, John Wesley didn't believe that any pastor should stay anywhere more than 18 months. If you give them everything you've got and you don't change anybody's way of doing things in 18 months, let somebody else have a chance, uh, which is very different than a lot of the churches. Uh, I think the Presbyterian Church, uh, 70 or 82% of the, the graduation of seminary for Presbyterians in the, in the uh, 1800s uh, stayed at one church that, their entire ministry. That was very different from Methodists, and that's one of the reasons why we move Methodists around, and then, um, and we don't uh, choose our clergy. The bishop chooses based on what they know about the church's need, uh, and then they the, the church can't vote to send them out to be something else because uh, uh, they the bishop has assigned them there. They can advise the bishop. Uh, but you can't have a, a, a church meeting and vote, a business meeting and vote the pastor out. Uh, that's not done in the Methodist church. You have to ask the bishop, if the, the bishop will have to decide if there's a good reason, uh, if there's a missional reason to leave that pastor there because of what they're doing, uh, they just might stay there. Uh, so uh, that's some of the things that uh, shape the Methodist church. Some extraordinary people, uh, uh, Bishop Coke and Bishop Asbury, uh, they put their, their names together for the publishing house uh, and called it Cokesbury, if you ever heard of that. Uh, but that's a, a combining of the two names. Uh, we've changed over the years a variety of ways, uh, been in, in involved in social movements. Uh, we were invo involved in temperance. We were all uh, involved in, uh, in opposing the slave trade. Uh, we were in, involved in the, the women's right to vote. Uh, we were involved in the civil rights movement. Uh, a lot of things, different things that the Methodist Church has, has championed uh, because we have such an active faith. And at one time, uh, there were more Methodist churches than there were post office in the country. And there, there was one, mo one uh, motion before Congress to make the Methodist Church the official church of the United States, uh, but that didn't pass. Uh, so neither did uh, uh, Ben Franklin's idea of making the turkey the uh, national bird. So some things just, just shouldn't be. Uh, but that's, that's some of the history of the Methodist Church. We, there's a lot more detail that you can go into if you, you're interested. Uh, pick up a book from the library. Uh, you remember books? Uh, we have, I've, got a lot, I've got a lot of them. And I, I, it's something about holding a book in your hand and studying about uh, something in the past. So I suggest you do that. Uh, all right, I'll see you next time.